Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Lords Group Trading PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged, they can be submitted at any time via the QA tab that's just situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all of the questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand you over to CEO Shankar Patel. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our first um, uh, trading update of 2023 which will cover our, our estimated results for the full year of 2022. Um, I'll leave you to read our disclaimer at your leisure, which is posted above. Um, the agenda for today is that I'll be presenting the highlights. My name is Shankar Patel. I am the CEO of Lords Group Trading PLC. My colleague, Chris Day, who is the CFO, will present the financial year 22 financial highlights. And between me and Chris, we will go through a few slides on our equity story and the outlook for 2023. We will follow that up with some Q&A after the presentation is over. Um, in terms of the highlights, you'll see a few bullet points here. And, and one of the, fain, the first comments that I have is that we have delivered on our IPO commitments in our first full year as a listed business. And we really are delighted with the, um, with the results of full year 2022. Um, what we're also seeing is that the demand in our RMI sector is still proving to be um, resilient and it's therefore providing us with a recurring revenue base. We also believe that um, any potential downturn in our business could be mitigated by the organic growth opportunities that exist for us in either new product ranges, new geographies or new customers. And therefore we also remain confident of our acquisition opportunities and are delighted with the acquisitions that we made in H1 2022 which are performing to management's expectation so far. On the next slide, I'll let Chris go through the financial highlights. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, delighted to present the uh, FY22 uh, highlights. I'll bring you through a couple of slides. Um, so first of all, I think, as, as Shank said, a really, really pleasing uh, set of results um, across all metrics, um, which are... Um, uh, across the board ahead of consensus and expectation uh, running through the through the table line by line revenue initially uh, revenue comes in at uh, 450 million for FY22 uh, which is a step up uh, year on year of 86.7 million or 23.9% uh, in, in total percentage growth that flows through into adjusted EBITDA of 28.3 million um, against a comparative 22.3 so an extra six million uh, adjusted EBITDA and a, and a growth of twenty six point nine percent. You can see that delta in, in the percentage change, and then that drops through into adjusted EBITDA margin, uh, which continues to accrete uh, six point three percent for the full year twenty two, against six point one for the full year twenty one. So point two percent improvement. And since IPO in so over over a two year period, that's now a point nine percent improvement in our in our EBITDA margin. Adjusted profit before tax uh, stands at uh, 16 million, and, and I should say the gold column is is at not less than position as we head into a uh, full year audit, so not less than 16 million uh, against an FY21 of 12.3, so 3.7 million step up and a 30.1% improvement. Um, the other point to call out here is is bullet point three. So um, we we finish thirty uh, first of December with a net debt position of twenty three point five million on a pre RFS basis, so just over one times uh, EBITDA. Uh, that's a position we're very comfortable with. We think we think there's headroom, and we we retain balance sheet strength to uh, pursue further uh, growth initiatives, whether they're organic or, or acquisitive led. So overall, uh, for the group, um, some some uh, really strong progression. I think clear market outperformance in, in the revenue growth, and we'll see the like for likes in, in a second, um, and, and kind of real evidence of executing the strategy and, and on target to hit those um, medium term numbers in terms of revenue at 500 million and EBITDA margin at 7.5%. 
stepping down into the first division, being merchanting, um, I think uh, absolutely fantastic performance. Um, revenue of uh, just under 221 million, 17.4% uh, like for like, uh, which is something we're, we're absolutely delighted with the with the teams and the manner in which they've achieved that. And overall, that's 90.3 million uh, incremental revenue in FY22. There are 69.2% uh, overall revenue growth. That that really is kind of uh, particularly the like for like um, is is testament to the service and products uh, led proposition that we have. So you know, we're offering that superior service and, and product knowledge through our exceptional colleagues is is really driving uh, extra footfall and customer acquisition in in our direction. Um, product price inflation. Uh, has clearly been prevalent throughout FY22. We, we spoke about it in, in all of our updates last year. Uh, it has softened towards the back end of, of FY22 and, and, and definitely kind of softening into um, FY23. And, and we are um, uh, the success rate of passing through those inflation repressures is, uh, has improved as well through the year. So something we're, we're, we're really pleased with. And then Merchanting as a whole for 2022 completed three acquisitions. Um, you can you could look back at previous presentations on on the website or Invest Meet Company. Uh, advanced reefing uh, in January 22, which brought for the first time kind of credibly brought um, uh, the roofing offer to our general builder population across the merchanting business. AW Learn, which operates at two locations in in Tamworth and Dewsbury, and uh, the Build Base Sudbury uh, asset purchase that went through in April 22. On to plumbing and heating, and, and I guess it, it's easier to see the plaudits in, in merchanting with that strong light for light, but we um, we think plumbing and heating has also had a, had a really strong year. Um, the visibility of that is, is slightly masked through the revenue position. Um, it's well documented that there's been an industry-wide boiler supply issue throughout the year. Again, softened through the year, you can see that in the in the light for likes. If you look at the half year versus the full year, you can see that that position has improved uh, substantially. Um, but at a revenue level, that that leaves negative nine point one percent revenue growth and negative one point six, um, including the benefit of the DHMP direct heating and HRP trade acquisitions from April twenty two. So the reason we're so pleased with, with with that performance is actually go back to the half year and, and we were showing EBITDA growth and EBITDA margin growth. Um, and, and I think it's fair to assume that um, when the full year results come through, that that, that kind of traction and momentum will, will still be there. We're achieving that by adding accretive margin products. Um, so the extended product range benefits from enjoying a, a, a stronger gross margin. Uh, it benefits from having a lower cost to serve because we're already delivering product to those customers so to take an incremental basket of products to the same customer as a low incremental cost to serve. We're, we're definitely seeing uh, the continuation of, of, of growing demand around energy efficient products, I think, for, for reasons that would be well understood. Um, but that's coming from both our customers, uh, but also suppliers who recognize that the unique position we we hold in the supply chain and, and our ability to deliver next day nationwide. Uh, whether that's to the independent merchant, the installer, or the homeowner. Um, we continue um, to realize pricing uh, opportunities. Um, we spoke in the half year again about uh, business intelligence tools that have gone on top of a new ERP system, and that's definitely helping us make kind of smarter um, customer pricing decisions. And the acquisition of of DHMP uh, is is trading in line with expectations, and, and we're we're absolutely kind of uh, delighted with the start it's made in in the business and the synergies that exist between between particularly between HRP Trade and, and APP wholesale. Back to back to Shanka um, for a slide on on our equity story. Thank you, Chris. Um, we thought that um, we would uh, reiterate to the market our equity story. And um, firstly, you know, what, what we're saying is that we fundamentally believe that, um, um, you know, we have a great equity story to offer. Um, we reiterate our position as a leading distributor of building materials in the UK. Our story is factored around six key areas. First being our unique customer first proposition. Um, 
I won't call out each bullet point, but a few to mention. And, and the first one is that fundamentally, we believe that engaged colleagues lead to a differentiated customer service proposition. And that is at the essence of our, of our business, a customer focused business. And we deliver that customer focus for the benefit of our customers through our engaged colleagues. We spend a, a, a substantial amount of time ensuring our colleagues remain engaged. We also therefore create long term loyal customer relationships. We're in markets where we have repeat customers, just repeat custom from a wide variety of customers fragmented right across our geographies and our product portfolios. So it allows us a tremendous amount of loyalty from our, from our customers. In terms of this next block, the, the organic and, and margin accretive growth, four key areas. Um, you'll see us repeat this um, consistently. New locations. We have an opportunity to grow many of our brands in, in new geographies. We shall be doing that over the coming years. We have digital initiatives that provide us with new customers or allow repeat customers to trade with us um, continuously in a very efficient and, and customer service, high, high customer service levels. We're also in pursuit of new products as we have the distributive capability, Chris has just mentioned, of taking on energy efficient products or new technologies because we have the distribution backbone right across the country to take products from, from our warehouses to our customers without in much incremental cost. And then we are also focused on the growing penetration of these de decarbonized products, i.e. boiler replacement products, energy efficient products, and, and that's a focus area which alert, again allows us to, to offer substantive margin and organic growth. In terms of our, our M&A history, we have a strong record of acquisition discipline. I once again reiterate um, something that I've said many times, that you can change everything about an acquisition once you buy it, except for the price that you pay for it. And discipline on M&A on still remains at the core of what we do. Uh, our markets are still fragmented, and therefore we have considerable opportunity for further acquisitions. Independent merchants of between two to 100 million turnover still only hold 40% of the market, and there are many for us to, 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 to acquire in, in due course. And the other point on acquisitions is that we believe we remain an attractive buyer for family businesses who are keen on ensuring that once they sell their business, it continues and it continues to develop. Um, we, we believe we are, we're a good buyer of these sort of assets. In terms of our strong financial profile, we're on track record to deliver our revenue targets by 2024. We are highly cash generative. That allows us the, the, um, the freedom to grow our business and invest in it. And we believe for our investors, the fact that we are dividend paying and we have a progressive dividend policy further reiterates our equity story. In terms of the final bullet point of a management track record, um, we we hope that we have demonstrated that we do what we say we're going to do. Um, we also believe that we are aligned with all of our shareholders via management holding a significant majority shareholding in the business. I'll hand over to Chris to talk through our medium term targets. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so I think regular uh, followers will, will recognize this slide. Um, we, we, we've got two two targets out there at the moment in, in terms of uh, medium term aspiration, albeit on the left hand side, it, it's coming very quickly. Um, so when we when we uh, came to IPO, we were working off a 2020 base at 298 million and we, and we set the ambition to be a 500 million revenue business by 2024. You can see now with the inclusion of uh, the 450 million for 2022, that gap now with um, with two years trading ahead of us looks looks perfectly uh, perfectly achievable, and we remain confident of that. And and we're confident because of the organic growth levers that exist, the, the thing Shankar spoke about, uh, the product range extension that can that can either take a bigger share of the wallet from existing customers or attract new ones. Um, new stores in new markets is, is, is clearly a great opportunity for us. Um, we're still only 46 locations across the UK um, with enormous um, catchments that, that we don't service um, and, and uh, acquisitions on top will, uh, will of course only help. On the, on the right hand side, um, medium term target of 7.5% EBITDA margin. Again, I hope you can see we're making good progress there. 
as I said earlier, it's a 0.2% step up in uh, FY22. And I think it's worth kind of acknowledging that is in that is an improvement in margin in a, in a highly inflationary period. Um, you know, that's coming through um, in, 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 in certain areas through the overheads, whether that's kind of utilities or diesel or uh, or labor um but absolutely coming through the um through the cost of goods um we're passing that on and more and, and driving that accretive EBITDA margin through operational leverage um through um through everything in the strategy um, that's designed to, to drive the EBITDA margin so we're, we're, we remain very confident and think um you know kind of we're already showing good good momentum on that target of our presentation is the outlook and in, in, in summary um you know, of course we are mindful of the uncertain macroeconomic um, conditions that we face at this moment in time and in particular our markets um in terms of construction and construction products is highly sensitive to any gdp decline but we still maintain that the reason lords is different and our investment proposition still remains a very good one is that the market is still large, and of which we are a very small player. We're still less than 1% of a £55 billion market. Um, we also believe that our market, in our markets, customer demand is resilient. Yes, of course, it will be impacted, but there are many of the products that we sell which simply are agnostic to any um, GDP or economical um, uh, downturns. Um, we, in addition to that, have some levers that will meet any potential um, downturn in the in, in, in the economic conditions. Firstly, it's the fact that our H122 acquisitions are performing very well, and we will start to see their contribution to in, in a full year uh, basis in 2023. Um, we also have plenty of organic growth levers to enable market outperformance. We, we keep on reiterating this. Um, we've just been through some of the the details on where we feel the organic levers exist and we'll be sure to use them to ensure that not only do we um, with, withstand whatever economic outlook downturn we face, but if possible, we, we grow our way out of the potential downturn. Um, we'd like to also once again reiterate that we are on track to deliver our 500 million revenue target by 2024 and our 7.5% bid down margin in the near term. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for listening. And I think we can head over to Q&A. Um, Shankar, absolutely. And Chris as well, thank you very much indeed uh, for your presentation this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Uh, Shankar, Chris, as you can see there in the Q&A tab, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation and uh, thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions and Chris Shankar perhaps if I now just hand back to you to respond to those where it's appropriate to do so um, and then I'll pick up from you at the end thank you okay. sure. yeah no problem um right so uh, first question from uh, Sam E uh, great progress any thoughts on international expansion or is the focus on capturing more share in the UK um so international expansion isn't isn't um, on our on our radar. Um, as we said in the previous slide, when you're less than one percent of a very large market, I think our shareholders would would not forgive us for for entering into markets that we clearly don't really understand at this moment in time. Albeit that we have a model that we may be able to to um, replicate in, in in certain certain geographies, um, but we don't think that shareholder value will be created by by doing something like that at this moment in time. We, we do therefore reiterate that capturing more share of the UK market is fundamental to our strategy and it remains, we remain on track to deliver that. I think there's another question from Sam E. Um, this is what makes a good acquisition in your view and how are you finding valuation expectations of those looking to sell? Um, very good question. Um, what makes a good acquisition? There are obviously multiple factors that make a good good acquisition. Um, location is one of them. Um, 
we analyze acquisitions for either are we going into new geographies and if we are does the asset that we're looking to purchase have good locations so physical locations are very important to us um, do they have a good customer proposition do they have a good product range proposition which um which will be in addition to us. So if you'd look at the advanced roofing, the advanced roofing was, was a business in, in a good geography in, in, in the um, home counties. It served a very good market. It filled a gap. We didn't have expertise in that particular product space and it had really good people. So all in all locations were, were, were very good. The customer proposition, we always vet that was, was good, always can be enhanced, which is, which is where we add our value added. Um, and then it brought us into a new product area, which was complementary to, to our current product portfolio. Chris, do you want to take one? Yeah, I was going to say just to add on the valuation point, we um, we, we have a yeah, sorry, uh, stated aim of, of four to six times EBITDA. Um, I think the five that have landed post IPO average 4.6 times uh, EBITDA. Um, so I think realistically we're... we're um, we're already kind of achieving valuations towards the towards the lower end of expectation. So the, the movement down it, it it starts to become an economical for the owner. Um, um, I think in terms of the question of how we're finding expectations of those looking to sell, I think no, no different to what it's always been. There's, there's always going to be a buyer and seller negotiation. Um, I think the fact that most of the sellers that we work with or, or transact with understand our parameters and and therefore you know the the approach we have is one of what we call a collaborative approach to a transaction it's not necessarily just the price it's the fact that you get a certain you get an outcome that is certain um if we've overbid and then in dd we find that um, we've over we're overpaying that leads to an uncertain transaction we avoid that um that process and therefore we're always making sure that we have a collaborative approach so that once we've agreed a price, then that price can be maintained and we make sure that we transact at that price without having to renegotiate. Um, we're also very selective on the assets that we, we look at and the conversations that we have. Okay, um, Nick B has asked, what is the current headcount and where do we see the number moving over the next 12 months? So. Um, Current number is is just below uh, nine hundred heads, um, and and we very much kind of uh, in, invest for, for for growth. So um, if we can see an opportunity to, to to continue to grow a branch or a certain location, then we, we understand that that needs to be to be backed um, with extra resource. But we run it kind of on a on a very uh, efficient model and have expectations of, of revenue per head um, in each of our divisions. Um, so. Um, sub 900 at the minute and and would continue to back growth okay um steve k uh what does the planned rollout look like for new organic sites and typically what are the costs associated um so we've got we've got two brands at the moment in the half year results that we spoke about in terms of where we we feel they can they can break out of their regional presence um the first is uh, George Lyons, which is a um, specialist civils and uh, landscaping um, merchant. Uh, it's a 2016 acquisition. It was it was one branch and and um, 12 million of revenue, and it it's grown to, to uh, three um, and almost 30 million of revenue now. So um, we we've looked at that and we think there's the opportunity to take three, and, and the third was opened in 2022 in Horsham. We think there's the opportunity to take three up to up into the range of eight to ten and um, that that would um that would be a very comfortable fit in in uh, in the target markets and catchments that are available to us um and the second one is mr central heating which is a brand in our plumbing and heating business it's quite unique at 25 percent of its revenue is uh is online which is which is pretty high penetration in our in our space it operates out of 10 locations the 10th was opened in in west bromwich in 2022 um, and we've said there we think we can get to uh, 50 sites, so 40 incremental. Um, we, we've worked in 2022 on the catchments and, and making sure that the, the West Bromwich site is uh, putting its best foot forward and, and then um, we'd expect to see that rollout accelerate um, um, a couple of new openings in 23 and, and then starting to accelerate in 24, 25. In terms of costs, 
uh, missed century heating, uh, all in capex working capital, uh, net working capital. You're looking at about half a million pounds uh, of outlay. Um, George Lines um, it is more because they're, they're bigger sites. It's not a trade counter. It's a you know it's an acre, an acre site. Um, you, you typically include in working capital for for George Lines. Be looking at anywhere between uh, seven hundred and, and a million pounds. Thank you, Chris. One more question. Uh, what do you think selling prices will do in 2023? Um, difficult to be very definitive given there are, you know, probably close to 40 to 50,000 products that we sell right across the board in, in all our different um, uh, brands and businesses. But if I may call out a few areas, um, you know, items that are commoditized such as timber, um, they have fallen uh, considerably in 2022 we don't think that there's um, any further decreases on on what and what is a major part of our business um so we don't feel that there's going to be further decreases in, in prices on that side on the heavy side building material um there will be potentially some marginal decreases in prices but again we don't see a very big decrease in prices expected. Um, capacity is still low in, in bricks and plasterboard and a lot of heavy side material. Um, whilst demand has been you know, in excess of capacity for the best part of 18 to 24 months, and we, we're all expecting demand to, to be lower, we don't feel demand is going to be sufficiently lower that prices will come tumbling down. Um, there is always a margin for, for trading and for, for localised pricing to come down as either merchants eat into their margin or manufacturers would like to eat into their margins. We prefer, obviously, for manufacturers to eat into their margins rather than for us to eat into ours. But it's 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 selected uh, selective. It will not be across um, the, the the market um, in, in, in any great form. Um, and in fact, we will probably see some price increases coming through as 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 our manufacturers and suppliers face price increases, notwithstanding the downturn in the economic um, outlook and, and the potential economic activity that will result. Shankar, Chris, if I may just jump back in there and thank you very much indeed for being so generous of your time and addressing all of those questions that came in from investors this afternoon. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended for you to review. To then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so, and we'll publish all those responses um, on the Investor Meet company platform. Shankar, perhaps before redirecting those on the call to provide you their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with that'd be great thank you um in, in terms of closing comments firstly thank you for your time in in attending this investor meet um, uh, presentation um, secondly we we really remain delighted with with our results but but more delighted with the the efforts of our colleagues you know the question was asked how many colleagues there are 900 just under 900 wonderful people working in our business and, and we, we, we thank them for, for all their hard work, which has resulted in, in a tremendous success for the business. And we also remain committed to, to meeting our, our near and medium term targets. And we believe we have an extremely resilient business and extremely flexible business that can react to, to market, um, market trends and, and crisis if, if there happens to be one during 2023. Uh, we also thank all our invest investors for their support and uh, wish you all a very good day. Shankar, Chris, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This won't take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Lords Group Trading PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good afternoon to you all.